Welcome back to the Football Fitness Federation podcast. This is episode 274. I'm delighted to welcome onto the podcast today, Phil Lerney. Phil, how are we doing? I'm all right, thanks. I didn't realise it was in 274 episodes, but <laughs> where is he? Um, thanks for having me. No, thank you for coming on. I really appreciate you coming on. You're someone who's worked that I follow for a long time, and there could be a, probably a long list of topics we could cover in this, which I feel like I probably sent you that anyway. <laughs> um, but well, yeah, we could get through some cool stuff. But Phil, there's probably a lot of people, a lot of listeners that are aware of the work that you've done and currently do as well. I wanted to start on your experience with team sport athletes, so not just football, but team sport athletes. Where do you feel they need the most support or have needed the most support? Oh, wow. Uh, depends on the sport, firstly. Uh, it, it's much like corporates. You know, when we go into corporate, we, we, we need to look at the culture. We need to, I was actually talking to someone yesterday about football and the culture behind football. We had quite an extensive conversation because he was an ex, ex-professional footballer. And and we got onto the topic of kind of the culture that sits behind sports. And and when you when you deal with athletes from different sports, and he was actually saying that he now coaches and he stopped coaching footballers for a long time because he found them that they were they were challenging just like every client is as, as a coach, but the challenges that they had were things that he at the time couldn't deal with and couldn't handle uh, because they were bringing something different to the table. So, so when you deal with athletes from different sports, you've, you've got to understand the dynamic of the sport. You've got to understand the culture that sits behind the sport. When you're dealing with them from a strength and conditioning or a, or a, a you know, a nutritional perspective or a wellness perspective, you've also got to consider all of that as well. Because because what happens there is that you're extending that that culture into really what you're trying to communicate with these people. And that culture can sometimes be in conflict with it. So it's it's a bit like dealing with just day-to-day clients. Everybody comes with a different challenge. Everybody comes with a different narrative on life. And, and that changes the way that you coach them, the way that you handle them. So so with respect to the challenges, the challenges are varied. Uh, you know, some overlap, some are always the same. Uh, you know, people, you know, and I know it's one of the topics that we're going to talk about today, but things like, you know, basic health and wellness things, people compromise because of overall culture. So if we think about the the culture of the UK, we can get into different countries and we start to talk about different culture in different countries, but it's a bit like looking at nutrition, people eat things in different countries. So when you're dealing with nutrition, you have to consider what people have available to them, what culturally they eat, uh, and that will come into how you handle them as a client. So for us, if you look at the culture in the UK with respect to, to how we've handled stress, and if we talk multi-generational, so if we go back, you know, we've almost got like cohorts of, of studies going on with human beings. And if you go back uh, in the corporate world, for example, you go back 50 years, the corporate culture that started to develop 50 years ago is the corporate culture we're now dealing with. So we're dealing with the repercussions of what people did 40 years ago. And it's the same with football. So if we look at football, and again, I'll, I'll always go back to football because that's what we're talking about uh, in many respects. If we look at football, all the things that the players of, for example, you know, best generation and Charlton and all these guys, there was a culture of what they did. And and slowly that culture evolved and changed into different things. And now the new footballers and the, the, the new professionals have a different culture. And, and there's things that are acceptable. You know, we used to live opposite a, a player from quite a well-known, well, I can say it because I'm not going to name the player, but he was a Crystal Palace player. And probably five nights a week, there was a delivery driver arrived at his door with KFC or McDonald's or something like that. <laughs> and that's part of that culture because, you know, they're signing, you know, they're signing people into that sport at a very early age. And with that early age becomes this kind of level of immaturity that that we don't expect to be developed. But because it's based on skill, and, and again, a good example is to go back to, uh, have you ever read the, the book Outliers? No, I haven't actually. So, so Outliers is the one that kind of defines this 10,000 hours of practice, right? And there's an interesting statistic from the NHL, the, the National Hockey League. Because they select their, their scholarship programs, almost like uh, junior and uh, 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 academies, because they select them so young, what happens is they pick all the biggest kids because everybody's at a similar skill set. You know, everybody's learned the best skills. Everybody's at a similar skill set. So what they do is they find that the most dominant players at these very, very young ages 
are all the biggest players. And typically all the biggest players were born in similar months because they've got two or three months on everybody else. So there was some crazy statistic. I can't remember it off, off the top of my head, but it's in outliers if anybody wants to reference it. Uh, and, and it's the majority of the NHL are all born in the same three months because of this culture, you and me. Yeah. Uh, and, and with sports comes this different culture. And again, I don't want to go off too many tangents, but in essence, when we talk about how do we handle and how do we deal and how do we coach people, it depends on the culture of the sport. It depends on the club they're playing at or whatever it might be will determine a lot of things. And also their own mentality around performance or behind nutrition or whatever it might be. Because again, you'll get the, you'll get the Harlands who come along and go, right, I don't really care what anybody else says. I'm going to go out there, I'm going to research it all for myself, and I'm going to find out what the best way of me getting the best out of myself is. You know, So these these are the players that are now evolu- you know, revolutionising the game. You go back to Wilkinson in rugby. You know, People were like, hold on, what made the difference with Wilkinson? And one, of the, one of the things that was most notable about Wilkinson is that when they finished the game, he'd go and practice, and he would continue to practice and go again and again and again. It, 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 it hit the same kick again and again. And I think there was a quote from Bruce Lee, wasn't there? It, you know, back in the day, which was, you know, I don't fear the man who has who's had ten thousand hours practice. I fear the man who's had ten thousand hours practice on a single punch. Yeah. You know, and this is kind of what these players did. You know, you repeatedly you see the American footballers; they have the the tires set up, and the quarterback just throw balls through tires. That's all they do, again and again, and again, and again, and again, until they hit it every time. You know, same as kick, you know, free kicks, right? You put a hole in the the top corner, and all you do is you kick it through it again and again and again. You look at the Beckhams, you look at the Haalands, you look at the Ronaldos, you look at these guys who are kind of changing the narrative. Because what happened when when Ronaldo first came into the game, all the players at United were looking at him going, what on earth is he doing? And then all of a sudden it started to dawn on them that, you know, hold on, his percentage is better than us on every front. So we better just pay attention to what he's doing. And you get this with, you know, normal culture. We see this with nutrition a lot with general day to day clients. Is they get your general day to clients. So let's say you were my client, and I and I, and I said, well, right, you're going to go into, you're going to prepare your own food, you know. So you go into work, you have this Tupperware container, and again, that might not be the approach, but let's say you do, you take it in, and all your work colleagues ridicule you a little bit because it's not normal. So they ridicule you a little bit, but then three months later, when you start looking in great, you know, in great shape, and you start to lean up a bit, and blah blah blah, all of a sudden that torment turns into, what's that you got there, Ben? What's that you got there? And then all of a sudden, there's somebody starts coming in with a Tupperware container, but because they haven't paid attention to what's in yours, they've got a yogurt, they've got an apple. It's like going back to school. They've got a sandwich. And they think the Tupperware is part of the equation, which it is, because you need something to carry your food in. Yeah. So so it's all these cultures that we're dealing with. So again, it kind of a bit of a tangent, but hopefully some take-homes there with respect to, you know, how do we deal with people? How do we handle people? And and particularly in team sports, because remember team sports is just a, a number of people made up of individuals. Mm-hmm. So, and, and for me as a coach, I never dealt with teams. I dealt with individuals from teams. I've done work with teams in the, in the past and, you know, that it comes with various challenges, but again, it's a, it's a similar process, but you're trying to manage multiples of people you know you might have a score of 20 that you're trying to manage and you can't manage 20 people as well as you can manage one person you know that's a lot to ask and one of the challenges you have with professional sport is that you have you know one snc guy one nutritional guy you know and and they have to manage everybody and that's a big job without having a team of people around you you know we did some work with liverpool uh, uh Mona and emma incredible nutritionist at, at liverpool and we did some work with her and and you know the challenge that she has to manage this entire squad of players but she has a team of people that work alongside her. So it's quite a cool setup. Yeah, 100%. I, I love that context as well, because it reminds me, I can't remember if someone said it on the podcast or it was a conversation or just out in, um, just been talked about somewhere. But when Phil Neville went to Everton and started doing extra work and the players started taking note and then gradually, because yeah. he was obviously bringing the Man United mentality, um, culture cool. and mentality yeah, across to Everton, then so, players started latching onto it. Um you know, you mentioned before about the conversation you had recently about football being different. Yeah. Um, or footballers being different in terms of the approach when you're working with them. Is that more on the sort of social side in terms of uh, that can come from the financial the differences that other sports have? Where where would you see that as being the difference? A bit of, bit of everything, really. What you've got to remember is that there's different levels of adoration. So this is a, a good one with respect to personal mentality. 
uh, is that what you what you get is you get you might get a fourteen year old kid who who gets signed by a rugby club, right? They don't get that magnitude of adoration and that magnitude of of pay, uh, that magnitude of anything until they reach the top echelons. And even then, they're not competing with footballers at a, a, a lower division level, even. But that's the pinnacle of their sport. Now, the pinnacle of their sport means that they can't they can't drive around in five different sports cars. They can't buy multiple properties. They can't, you know, because it doesn't facilitate that. Whereas you get a 14 year old kid signs for a club, all of a sudden they're getting paid quite a good amount of money for a 14 year old kid. You know, all their parents are getting that money. But, but when they get to 18 and 19 and they're still getting that money, the problem you've got there is that you've got to realize that a footballer's career is what, 10 years max. You know, in general, you know, 10 years, if you get 10 years out of your career as a footballer, you're doing pretty well, right? If you, you know, some people get a little bit more, some people get, but ultimately, all of this is hinged on this really fragile aspect of if you get a knee injury, you don't come back from that. That money that you've earned in that two year career or three year career, or whatever you had, has to last you a lifetime. The problem you have is that when you came into that culture, the culture was to spend your money on flamboyant things, was to, you know, the first thing you get your sign on fee. So then you go out and you look at what all the other players have got with respect to cars and you go and buy one, you know, and, and remember all of that changes and alters someone's mentality and it, it alters people's mentality around work because if you're being given money, I always say it's, it, it's like a, uh, it's like the silver spoon mentality, right? If I just give you some money, Ben, right? Give you some money. I give you a car, I give you a house. How much respect are you going to have for that money? How much respect are you going to have for the house? How much respect are you going to have for the car? Compared to if you grafted, grafted really hard to get all that for yourself. You see that with lottery winners, don't you? Yeah, because yeah. they have no idea how to handle money. Mm. Straight away, they get this, you know, this huge amount of money that they then have to uh, process and understand how to manage. And, and remember, the, you know, these footballers in the early in their career, they're not getting taught how to manage money. They're not getting told that your career might only last two years. You know, if you get a knee injury, which is always possible, there's nobody oblivious to this, right? There isn't a single person of footballer out there that isn't one tackle away from their career ended, right? It's that simple. So with respect to the, the foundation that you would need to build as a sport, but the problem you've got as a sport with football, and particularly in the UK, is that you've got millions and millions of players fighting for one particular place. Is that when, you know, apart from the, the, the prodigies, apart from the prodigies who they care about, in essence, most clubs will probably have nine or 10 players that are, that are dispensable. That there's somebody who equally as good can come in and fill their boots. There's somebody else that will do that. And, and this has been true throughout, you know, you look at Premier League sport, you look at, go back 10 years and look at who were the prospects and see how many of them are still about. They've gone, they got injured. They, they, they you know, they, they, they just went through a bad patch and, and then got palmed off to another club and then progressively went down the leagues. And, and, and it, obviously each one of them is managing their own little career bubble and they've got their agents and blah, blah, blah. And bad decisions are made, but ultimately a lot of the time, it's because their mentality isn't there, the work isn't there, the work ethic hasn't been built into them. Because remember, if you're signed on a skill-based sports, so again, uh, let's talk about uh, Luke, uh, Luke the Nuke in darts, right? It's a skill-based sport, right? And this happens in in all skill-based sports. All it takes, and, and and I remember I used to play fairly decent level of cricket, and they used to call it the yips. Have you heard of the yips? Yeah. Right, so the yips, right? So you can get a bowler who's world-class, but all of a sudden just has a problem just letting go of the ball at the right time. They used to call it the yips. And it just hits them. And it's a mentality thing. And remember, a lot of these things, it's a bit like when, you know, when something gets fixated into your brain, you're trying to fix it. Remember, he's trying to get rid of it. So he's consciously thinking now, I've got to let go of the ball. I've got to let go of the ball. I've got to let go of the ball. Whereas previously, he didn't even think about that. So it's like the, the pink elephant. So if I tell you not to think about a pink elephant, what do you start doing? You start removing the pink elephant from your brain, but the only way you can do that is to think about the pink elephant. Right? <laughs> so this is what happens. So, so you know, press. You look at a footballer, you know, they're riddled with press. All of a sudden, somebody starts to say something about them or whatever it might be. Everybody processes that differently. 
You know, I remember, you know, there's various times throughout my entire career as a, as just as a person, right? You know, and, and I talk about being a person as a career. It's, it's a career, right? Where people have told me I can't do something. Now, I have a mentality where if somebody tells me I can't do something, I'll prove them wrong. So I feed off that. Whereas there's other people who tell me you can't do something, they'll turn around to you and go, yeah, I totally believe you. And now I just, I, I will now run that around in my head constantly that I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy of this. So I therefore don't really want to put the effort in. It's kind of pointless anyways, because I know I'm not worthy. And, and it's that mentality. And all it takes is, is you know, for an 18-year-old football prodigy to, to have something said about him in the press, he reads it, and then it just starts that. And that's it. So it's a lot of the time. But again, that wasn't the type of people I dealt with. You know, I just know this through dealing with corporates, people, blah, 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 in general. The people that I would deal with were predominantly from injuries. So, so when what happens is is clubs are very precious, particularly in in football. Clubs are very precious about they won't let their players see other coaches outside of the club environment. You know, they're, they're, which is quite right. You know, they shouldn't really. They should go. We can manage all of this internally, but a lot of them can't. So, what happens when a player gets injured? They almost get put on that pile. Mm. They're like, you know, on a pile. If you make it through, if you make it through, and you come back, blah blah blah. That's on you. So what would happen, I would quite often get, you know, and I work with one of the big physios in the in the UK, renowned, potentially probably one of the best physios in the world, you know, incredible. But he would deal with these soccer players when they've been put on that heap. So they, they out off their own back, start to see him because they knew he was renowned at getting people back to where they were before, not just fixing them, getting them back to where they were. And in some cases, sometimes better. So you might have somebody with a current injury. I remember dealt with I dealt with a rugby player who, uh, well, we dealt with a rugby player collectively, uh, who who'd had a history throughout their entire career of hamstring strains. And what, what happened is they'd they'd ruptured their hamstring early on in their career, and they had scar tissue on their hamstring, but nobody had got rid of all the scar tissue. So they had this quite bad tear on their hamstring. You know, uh, different grades of tears, right? So it was quite a high grade tear. So what happened is we went in and just cleaned everything out. So, you know, there was some surgery involved, blah, blah, blah. But they just cleaned it all out. So then his hamstring was repaired, but there was no scar tissue anymore, you know, or minimal scar tissue. You never clear it all but there was minimal scar tissue. So now what happened? He went back into his career and never suffered from hamstring problems anymore. You know, so so there's, there's all these tiny little things. So a lot of the people that I dealt with as a, as a coach were people that were either coming back from injury. So it'd be part of a rehab program. Uh, so they've been put on a heap. Or it would be people. So I dealt with a lot of, uh, I actually ended up dealing with quite a few American footballers. So when, because of my ties with various coaches in the US, I would quite often get referred uh, NFL players. So when when they came over for the, then they started playing the UK games, I would quite often train quite a few of the footballers, you know, because it was, you know, they, they needed a coach they could trust who, you know, knew the mechanics and and all they would do is send me a little email, tell me a bit about their injury history, what they can and can't do. And I'd be like, right, no problem. And would end up coaching them. So, so yeah, it was, so yeah, everything comes with different challenges, but again, football as a sport comes with its own internal challenges that affect the way that we can coach people. Yeah. hundred percent. Phil, I wanted to touch on some topics because I saw, we came to watch you talk at the Performex um, right. conference whenever that was i can't remember when that was june july some, some, yeah, something, something like, like that. that and there was a lot of topics that you covered in that which i thought would relate really nicely to the listeners of this podcast yeah which are around recovery sleep so i wanted to um touch on recovery because obviously we're at a point of the season now where we're off the back of the christmas period which has been pretty chaotic and a lot of coaches will be fighting the fact of just recovering their players to play the next game at the minute. That's where we're at in the season. So I wanted to talk about recovery, where we should focus our energy, our time with players, and maybe um, a bit of myth-busting as well, because there's a lot of stuff out there that comes up, a lot of trends that come up. You can throw me the myths at me. (laughs) I don't know where to start or stop on that. But yeah, Yeah, we can can tackle a bit of that as well. But yeah, we're just around recovery, really, where where your thoughts go with that, where we should focus our time. Right, so again... Going on about culture, right? So, so probably globally, even uh, we have this culture where uh, if you want to work hard in life, you know, be that in sport or corporate levels or whatever it might be, the one thing you need is more time, right? So, so what do people do? The first thing that people compromise is sleep, 
right? But we know we know from science, we know from data, we know from all of this stuff that if you compromise sleep, you compromise recovery on every level. So if you want to get leaner, sleep more. You know, you want to perform better, sleep more. You want to cognitively perform better, sleep more. You know, and it's not always more, it's higher quality. So if you're getting your, your, your seven to nine hours of sleep every night, but it's not high quality, we've then got a problem because then sleep is impacted. So for example, uh, alcohol, I talked about alcohol at, at Performex. And again, it, it might, might relate to some football players, might not, mm. you know, but probably lower levels perhaps. But one of the, if we go back and just, just to touch on this, because this is something that I, I would imagine many of your listeners also listen to was the, uh, I can remember the name of the podcast, Gary Neville's podcast. What's it called? Oh, Overlap. Overlap, overlap, overlap yeah. over something. Yeah, overlap. I think. So, so on his podcast, he had Deli Ali on. Yes. Right. And did you see that one? Yes. Right. So Deli Ali uh, alluded to the fact that there's a high percentage of Premier League footballers who are addicted to sleeping pills. Yeah. Right? Because they struggle to sleep. Right. Now, if they struggle to sleep, they also struggle to recover. If they struggle to recover, so all we're looking at when we're, you know, we we talk about a thing called the Yerkes Dodson law which is essentially there's a level of stress that any human being could tolerate before they break, right? This is physical, this is cognitive, this is mental, this is everything, right? So so there's various things that uh, we used to deal with a lab in London that used to deal with blood work. And they had a, they, they at the time were dealing with Arsenal. Arsenal were one of the real uh, trailblazers in the world of sports science. They were one of the first that brought it in. Uh, Arsene Wenger was big on it. He brought a lot of it to the table, and they they started to look at nutrition. They started to look at recovery, and they were dealing with Arsenal at the time. And they used to do regular blood work on all the players, and they used to do saliva testing and various other things. And again, you know, this is this is a lot of years ago. And what had happened is one of the players, their blood work had flagged up as 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 at a high risk of injury. So there's various markers in the bloods that when they start to elevate, you're like, whoa, whoa this person's got a high risk of injury at this point. You know, and it could be physical or mental. So they told them to rest one of their players. They said, look, there's some markers showing up. So they went back to the player and they said, look, you know, are you eating well? You know, how's your training going? They interviewed them basically and, and asked them all these things. And they were like, no, everything's cool. Everything's great. So they played him and he got injured. And this was an injury that cost him, I think, more than half a season, if I recall correctly. And, and what happened was about two weeks later in the press, it came out about something he'd been doing that he shouldn't have been doing and it was like personal you know it was uh you know and and in essence he just denied it all so when the club asked about it he knew it had got out to the press but he just didn't tell anybody you know he knew it was coming you know his agent would have known he knew everybody knew but there was nothing been publicized at that point they he knew they got a hold of it at this point so all these blood markers he was stressed he was massively stressed but it showed up in his bloods, but it didn't make any sense to the, the teams, so they played him. So when we look at all of these different myriads, so when I'm coaching a, a player, what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to train them as hard as I possibly can. Now, if that's just my mentality, kind of the David Goggins mentality, right? So they were all harping on about David Goggins training the UFC fighter. Because yeah. Goggins' mentality is just work as hard as humanly possible all the time. Yeah. Now, to us as coaches, that just reeks injury <laughs> it's like you are going to injure someone so all the sports scientists that grabbed onto the fact that he was le- he was training tony what's his name uh tony yeah, ferguson, ferguson yeah was the fact that he was just hammering him into the ground making him sick and blah 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 and, you know if we get a player that's sick yeah he's been working hard but now we've got to rehydrate them and hydration is one of the biggest problems with injury dehydration is one of the biggest causes of injury good right you know if you dehydrate muscles they 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 that the potential for them tearing or snapping goes up exponentially so hydration is a massive one right so you don't want players being sick because being sick and you know if somebody has diarrhea or they're sick they lose huge amounts of fluid and electrolytes so you don't want that happening so to repeatedly get someone to that stage where they're throwing up is crazy as a coach so we're constantly trying to push the envelope of how much can we challenge them but how much can we get them to recover and the main and the key aspect to recovery is sleep. And the problem that we had, and again, going back to the Deli Alley thing, is that when you're having kickoffs at 8, 8.30 at night, what's happening is these clubs are jacking their players up on caffeine. Yeah. If you have caffeine at 8 o'clock at night, you're not going to sleep. It doesn't matter who you are. So all the listeners that are going, oh, yeah, but I have a coffee late at night, you'll still fall asleep. But the quality of sleep that you have will be dreadful. 
And again, just to touch back on alcohol, because again, we kind of went down that route, but never got there. Alcohol, two units of alcohol, which is one drink in essence, right? One drink will affect your sleep quality by 9%. So if I'm giving you a grade out of 10, so every morning you wake up, if you have a drink every night to help you sleep, which it will because it's a, it's a depressant, it'll help you sleep. It kind of has sedative properties to some degree. It'll help you sleep, but your quality of sleep will diminish. So sleep consistency, there's various markers that will see diminish. People who've been wearing things like Whoops or Uras or Apple Watches, they'll see that happen. So now you're going to get a 9 out of 10. If you add into that that the, your bedroom's a bit too warm, you're now at an 8 out of 10. You add into that, you've got a bit of stuff playing on your mind before you fall asleep. So you don't fall asleep quite as effectively. You're now at a 7 out of 10. So the more that goes down, the less we can push you the next day. So if you get 10 out of 10 on your sleep, I can push you 10 out of 10. If you get 7 out of 10 on your sleep, I can only push you to 7. Now, if you add that up every single day of your entire football career, who's the best player? The best player is the one that did the 10 and the 10. You look at Haaland. What's Haaland trying to achieve? 10 and 10. Every day. He works on his sleep, he works on his nutrition, he works on his recovery, which means that when he goes out to train, he can go to the gym twice a day and also go out and do all the skill-based stuff and also minimize his risk of injury. And don't get me wrong, he's still the same as every other player out there. He's one bad tackle away from a end, career-ending injury. But it means that when that tackle comes in, his tissue and his regeneration and all of this stuff has the ability to either prevent the injury happening in the first place. Because remember, if you get, go in and a two-footed tackle on somebody who's dehydrated, you'll probably snap something. You go into somebody who's super hydrated, the chances are less. You go to somebody who's really mobile, chances are less. You go into somebody who's worked on all those things and the fitness and the recovery, the chances are less. And even if it happens, their recovery is faster. So not only will they get injured, but they'll come back quicker. And because their mentality is in this mentality of, I will do anything it takes, when a physio turns around to him and says, you have to do 800 reps of this per day, he'll go, okay. Yeah. You do that to a footballer with a, with a mentality of eating KFC every night, they're going to go, oh, I'll, maybe do, I'll maybe do 200 because 800 is a lot. Yeah? So there's yeah. a mentality aspect. So so the people that I would see, you, you can imagine, you know, I, I charged a lot of money, right? The people that I saw had the mentality of, they weren't eating the KFCs. They had the mentality of, I will do whatever it takes to get, achieve what I want. So th they were very easy clients for me. It was like, I tell them what to do. They go away and do it. And by the time they've came to me, they've came to me off their own back. I haven't chased them and pursued them and gone, do you want to be my client? Do you want to be my client? They came to me. So at that point, their mentality is, whatever Phil tells me to do, I will do. I can tell them to you know, go home and tap the top of your head a million times. They go, okay. Yeah, so so there's that mentality aspect of it. So so sleep is always a biggie. Caffeine management is a problem, uh, which we talk about just in general culture. We have a culture of people who overstimulate. So remember, if you take if you if you have a good relationship with stimulants, you can make them work for you. They're incredible. Caffeine is one of the best performance enhancing aids on the planet. Problem is that the footballing calendar doesn't coordinate terribly well with people taking caffeine because yeah. a lot of it coughs in the evening. You know, back in the day, and remember, all that's dictated by TV. You know, back in the day, football used to kick off at midday or two o'clock or three o'clock. You know, so you can get away with it. You can have a load of caffeine and blah, blah. And, you know, you can do that. And you had a load of time after the game to wind yourself down from this adoration and these hundreds of thousands, these 50,000 people that were watching you. You, could, you had a chance to wind down and taper down before it was bedtime. Now you don't. They literally leave the stadium and, and within an hour, they need to be asleep. Because the the club's calling a minute again at seven o'clock the next morning to do, you know, squad work. You know, so so the, the and people say you know sports are more demanding than ever, but there's certain factors within the sport that have caused that. You know, if you had a two or three o'clock kickoff most days, people have got time to recover. You know, they've got time to wind down and relax and sleep better and blah blah blah. But they've also got time to go out and drink. Yeah. If you go back to again the culture of football back in the seventies, every single one of them would have a pint in their hand that. You know, at seven o'clock at night, because they've finished the game, they go out and celebrate a little bit. And it was kind of almost like the rugby culture, you know, and that's a culture that took a long time to adapt and, and adjust because we had to see what would happen if people did it. And that takes decades to go, oh, well, it does me no harm. People look at sleep now. Alcohol does me no harm, helps me sleep. Because again, when you said two units, now four units, so two drinks, that's going to knock you out, right? You fall asleep, but it's 
is damaging your sleep quality by 40%. And people will argue, but go, no, it doesn't. Wear some tech, wear some yeah. whoops, 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 you know, whatever. It, it will show you. So therefore, you wake up the next morning thinking, oh, I've had seven or nine hours of my eyes closed. But the quality of that, what's happened during that time, it's a bit like somebody turning up to work doing a nine to five. Oh, I do eight hours work every day. Really? Yeah, do you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and this is one of the things I always go at coaches. You know, when I was a coach, if I was with a client, I was with a client. I was working. Eight hours as a coach a day is mentally and physically so taxing because you can't switch off. You've got eight hours being switched on. You look at somebody who goes into an office job, are you genuinely switched on for eight hours? Or do you go and check your, you know, your Facebook or your Instagram or whatever it might be? Don't get me wrong, there will be people out there who are doing eight hours solid. Mm. You know, I've got a couple of my friends, a couple of our investors and blah, blah, blah. They're mad. Like, they do not switch off. It's 100 miles an hour all the time. But they also consider their recovery. Hence why they're our investors. Because they're like, look, recovery is a biggie for me. So what you're doing really interests me. Because if you can help me recover and sleep better, even though I, I've got this very minimal opportunity to do it, we're back to where we are. So caffeine, again, just for something for your listeners to leave with, caffeine shouldn't be consumed for the first 60 to 90 minutes of your day. Multiple reasons for that. But caffeine relies on adenosine being present in your system for it to work. When you wake up in the morning, if you've slept well, there is no adenosine, right? It's a compound that drives sleep pressure, and it's a byproduct of using energy. So when you wake up and you're physically and you're, you know, and the problem we have, again, is when these footballers go in at 7 o'clock in the morning, if their sleep's been terrible, they're going into that session with a high level of sleep pressure. So they're they're already tired, you know? And, and again, I could throw this out at every single one of your listeners. Ask yourself, when you're tired, do you perform at your best? There isn't a single person that will turn around to me and go, yes. You know, so if I can improve your sleep, I improve your performance. Whoever you are, whether you're corporate, whether you're trying to make money, whether you're trying to be, become a better footballer, better rugby player, it doesn't matter. I'll improve your performance. So, so 60 to 90 minutes after you wake, don't take caffeine in that first 60 to 90 minute window. Because you've also got a thing called a cortisol awakening response, which relies on jacking up your sympathetic nervous system. If you take caffeine, caffeine overrides that and does it using caffeine, which we don't want to do. So 60 to 90 minutes into your day, caffeine is way more effective. Caffeine is actually way more effective the later in the day you take it. But there's a point there where it starts to compromise sleep. So six to eight hours after you wake up, you should cut your caffeine. No more caffeine after that point. And even that's a stretch. Six is probably tops for a lot of people. Eight, some people can push it to. If you do a lot of physical work after that eight, your body will metabolize the caffeine a little bit quicker. So some people get away with it, other people don't. So six hours is kind of the tops of that's your window to take caffeine. But nobody puts rules on caffeine, right? You can walk into any news agent at any point of the day and grab a monster or a Red Bull or whatever it might be. And, and none of them tell you, none of them say, oh, you shouldn't have this in the afternoon because it'll disrupt your sleep. You know, nobody at a coffee, we don't see coffee shops closing at two o'clock. You know, people are like, I've got to get through my day. And biologically, so again, just to touch on a little bit of the biology, is that is that when we wake up, uh, we have about an eight hour, eight hour window before our system starts to shut down. And remember, the nine to five day was, you know, it was invented by Henry Ford back in 1926. He just decided one day that nine five worked. There was no biology considered. So, so when we get that afternoon slump that we talk about, so again, go back on football back in the day you know three o'clock kickoff is bang in the middle of that slump so so they'd offset that by consuming caffeine or a cup of coffee or whatever I mean, some people used to drink alcohol you know yeah. before they played because it, nice <laughs> yeah, it would relax their nerves and to this day i i know of premier league footballers who have a shot of alcohol before they go yeah. Yeah. but it but there, there are some there actually is a little bit of science behind that to some degree i'm not saying that people should be doing it because there's 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 pros and cons to it but for some people, it just relaxes them a little bit. It just takes the edge off, right? You know, because that's a big deal walking out in front of, you know, 50,000 people and, you know, pressure's on and and some people handle it in different ways. So so the, the challenge we have there is that people over caffeinate. So we culturally, we overstimulate. You know, you look at the level of coffee that's sold in this country, you look at the level of stimulants and, you know, energy drinks and blah, blah, blah. And if you take too many stimulants and you take it too late, you've then got to rely on a depressant to get you to sleep. And the, the depressant people go to is alcohol. So again, I always talk about teachers because teaching is a very stressful job. You know, people look at it, it's just a very routine job. It's a very stressful job. The handling 30, 40 kids in it is a stressful job, right? So what happens is they get into this culture of overstimulating. So coffee, 
you know, we all talk about teacher's breath, is just somebody who smells a coffee, right? So, so, but the culture is, is that a lot of people, they start as teachers and everything's cool. They have one cup of coffee a day. Now, culturally, every break, everybody drinks coffee. So you start. Now, all of a sudden, you're consuming four cups of coffee a day. Now, now, the only way that you can help yourself sleep now is to have a couple of glasses of wine when you get in or a couple of bottles of beer. So culturally, they start doing that. The problem they got there is that then damaged sleep. So they're waking up the next morning with a load of sleep pressure. Now, if the only way we can offset sleep pressure, the easiest way to offset sleep pressure is just take a load more stimulants. And then we're in this cycle, this vicious cycle. So, so with respect to performance and really recovery, sleep is the king, absolute king. You know, you talk about post-workout drinks and recovery drinks and blah, blah, blah. Don't get me wrong, they're the players, but sleep is king. You know, if I wanted to... And, and I've experienced this, you know, I went through a phase of my career where I was like, oh, I'm just one of the people that needs five hours sleep. No, I wasn't. I wasn't. I just kidded myself that that was the case because I was in this and that culture, you know, I'm, I'm mid forties, right? So, so culturally I was in that, uh, that culture of you just got to grind, you just got to work hard, you got to work long hours, you got to sleep less, you got to do. And I was in that culture. I was in the back end of that culture. And what's happening now culturally is people are going, you know, um, I was chatting to a friend the other day who is in big corporate. He goes, a lot of the new people that we employ aged between 20 and 25 don't drink at all. You know, you yeah. go back to years, people think they were weird. Yeah. You know, they don't drink at all. You know, and he says, this is the norm. You know, is that we're seeing more people come in who don't drink. It's kind of like smoking, right? You know? Yeah. Nobody smokes. Bizarre to see somebody with a cigarette in their hand nowadays. It's like, wow, that person's smoking. You're like, that's a bit weird. Whereas you go back 20 years, everybody did it. You know, it was just a thing. You know, but then we understand that it took a generation. It goes back to one of my first points is that we had to observe people smoking for a long time before we realized that, oh, all the stuff they said about killing you, they're right. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And it took a long time. And even now, on the back of the pack, it says this will kill you. But people carry on. But it's like anything, right? Is that, is that you know, there's, it's, it's calculated risk, right? And I always say, it's look, it's, it's knowledgeable risk. You know, people take drugs, people take stimulants, people take all these things. But if you don't have it with the base of knowledge, caffeine's phenomenal. But if you manage it badly, it's, uh, it's horrendous. It's it's real nightmare with respect to recovery and performance and all these different things. So, so we talked a lot. And again, we talked a lot about this poem because it was management of caffeine is that you got a six hour window and then your body's got to wind down. And, you know, six to eight hours after we wake up, the body actually starts to shift phases and your autonomic nervous system actually starts to shift into what we call a parasympathetic state. So it moves into a rest and digest state. So at that point it's going, right, I need to calm myself down. And the problem you've got is that if you've got a footballer kicking off at eight o'clock at night, they've got to jack their sympathetic nervous system right back up again. And it's possible, but this is why with some of the strategies that, that I've certainly implemented with, with footballers, you know, historically is afternoon sleeping, is napping into the afternoon, you know, because they've got opportunity to do it, especially if they're full-time professionals, is what I do is, is you know, we'd, we'd, we'd put them into two different phases and what we call biphasic sleeping where what we do is they'd go in and train in the morning, then we get them to come home at lunchtime. Or, or, and, and whilst that slump hits, they'd actually take a, a strategic nap, which would either be sub 30 minutes or it would be over 90. And that's to do with sleep cycles. Yeah. You know, you don't sleep in between that. Yeah. It's a bit like kids. Have you got any, have you got young kids? Yeah. I've got yeah, a two-year-old and four-year-old. Oh, well, here we go, right? <laughs> so, so if you let them nap for less than 30 minutes, you're cool. Yeah. They'll wake up. They've had their nap. They've had this little power up, blah, blah, blah. Let them sleep anywhere between 30 and 90. You try and wake them up, it will be a storm. Yeah. Right? But let them sleep more than 90. They've had a full sleep cycle and they wake up fine. Yeah, so true. There's no better example of it. Yeah. You know, and this is to do with sleep cycles. So it allows them to go into full sleep cycle. It's a bit like uh, why you don't wake up people sleepwalking because it's to do with the stage of sleep that they're in for that to happen. So they, you wake them up, they're all like, oh, I don't know where I am. I'm really confused. I'm, you know, and it can cause a lot of stress to people. So, so the, the, the general notion is you don't wake people up in that state. And, and this is what we do with kids. You know, if, if, they, if they're going to have a nap, make sure it's sub 30. Hmm. You know, otherwise, yeah, you're in for it. I love that you brought up the night games. Because when I was thinking about our conversation, I was like, 
what would people see as the biggest challenge in terms of sports scientists, S and C coaches working in clubs? And I think the night game is definitely one because of all the things that you've touched on already. So I'd love to touch on a, a couple of bit sort of before and after. So in terms of the use of caffeine, you've mentioned there about the afternoon sleeping. Yeah. But how would then how would caffeine be used then for an evening game? And also just off the back of that, players a lot of the time will kick off. There's, I mean, they're getting later now. There was a I went to a game the other night, it was a quarter past eight kickoff. Yeah. Even I couldn't get to sleep when I got back. I hadn't even played. I'd just been to watch and I couldn't get to sleep. Yeah. So I can't imagine what the players were like. But then they're then expected to go sleep and then get into training the next day as well. Right. So, so yeah. So should we put a structure together? Yeah, that'd be great. Right. Right. So so first rule, right? You're gonna need if you're a professional player or or playing at any level, right? If you want to recover properly, you're gonna need seven to nine hours sleep, right? There is no exception to that rule. You know, people kid themselves that they only need a few hours sleep, blah, blah, blah. Seven to nine, standard, right? Ideally, you probably want to be further towards nine than you are to the seven, especially if you're a professional, right? And also you've got opportunity to do that. So let's say, let's base it at seven for now, right? Seven. So, so it's a bit like asking people to eat five pieces of fruit and veg. They compromised that because they didn't think people would do the full amount. Yeah. So let's go seven, right? So you need seven hours. So... Whatever happens at the end of every 24 hour cycle, I want seven hours of solid sleep in there. Whatever happens, I'm putting five fingers up there. It's seven. <laughs> so we need seven, right? So from the moment we wake up, so when we wake up and we expose our optic nerve to light, let's assume that's happening. Now we can't assume that's happening because if people are getting up at 6 a.m., there is no light. So we can manage this. And this is a lot of stuff there. And I don't want to get too complicated, but uh, you know, I get up, I come into my office and I turn this gadget on what we call an SAD light. So straight away, that has signified to my body I'm awake. So at that point, melatonin starts to drop, which helps me sleep, and serotonin starts to go, which helps me wake up. What happens concurrently with that is that my sympathetic nervous system now wakes me up. So cortisol starts to raise up, and cortisol starts to kick in my sympathetic nervous system to enable me to do my day, right? So if I wake up in the pitch black dark and I spend the next three hours in the pitch black dark, I'm going to remain tired because melatonin still continues to be in my system. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. So so the first thing that people have got to do is really expose their optic nerve to light. So I would always talk about light management. It's a little bit more complex, uh, you know, of a topic. And people look at it as a bit weird, but it's not weird. We're the only mammals on the planet that don't wake up to the sun coming up. So, so you will have seen uh, Liverpool. Hey, look, we had a few conversations with them. But Liverpool, uh, was it the middle of last season? They started getting the players up in the morning and walking around city centres. Did you see that? I they didn't, were, but... They were like, why are, these, all these play, why are these Premier League players going for a walk in the morning? Not to say we had anything to do with that, but strangely enough, we had the conversation, and very soon after, they were going out their hotels and walking around, exposing their optic nerves to light. Yeah. Right. So you guarantee we even talked to them about the position of the hotels. So when they book the hotels for the players to stay in, we said, look, it's make sure that you book all the ones that are on the side where the sun comes up. So the first thing players do in the morning is open the curtains. They got sun exposure. Yeah. Makes sense. Right? For these reasons, this is a basic biological function. Right. So let's assume you've woken up. So hypothetically six, most, most clubs start at about seven, right? You need to be in training for seven. So let's say you get up at six. First thing you do, expose your optic nerve to light. Now, you don't want to consume caffeine for the first 60 to 90 minutes, so you don't consume caffeine. But the first thing you need to do is hydrate. So, again, this is going to sound like a product pitch, but we designed a hydration formula to hydrate people rapidly at that point. It's a high-concentration electrolyte that just basically pulls fluids into your cells. So, first goal is cellular hydration. That means that that person, at 7 o'clock, whether they hit the gym or whether they're going into work or whether they've got enough hydration in their cells for their brain to function properly and them to physically function properly that's a key goal for us you know as a performance brand that is looking at the performance of everybody the first thing i'm going to do in the morning is hydrate so if you think about these people that have a glass of water with the lemon and the salt what do you think the salt is the yeah. yeah so we've got a concentration of electrolytes sodium potassium magnesium the idea is get that into your system hydrate your cells right now 60 to 90 minutes later caffeine can now do its job so just as you get into training at seven, 
you probably want to then start to think about having a caffeinated drink, whether that's a coffee, an espresso, or it might be our product, which is what we call Rise, which is a caffeinated product. It's got some B vitamins in there, electrolytes. Uh, it's designed for that first window of the day, the first six to eight hours of the day. So you have your caffeine at that point. You do your training. So remember training, this is learning your skills, this is your performance, this is your physical stuff, whatever you're doing. Most clubs will do skill-based stuff in the morning because cognitively we perform better in the morning hours because that's when our sympathetic nervous system is working the best. So if you do all the skill-based stuff, the team-based stuff in the morning, which is how most clubs do it, that's your window. And that's why they do it there. So if I'm working with a pro athlete and I've got two windows, I will weight train in the evening and I'll do skill-based stuff in the morning. So anything to do with motor control, motor uh, function is all in the morning. Yeah. Because their brain is working better. So they can take skills and they can absorb them. Yeah. So if you're, again, whether you're amateur or professional, if you're going to do skill-based stuff, do it in the morning. You know, that's the window for learning. Six hours later, you want to be cutting out caffeine. So no more caffeine after that point. Obviously, throughout the day, you need to be consuming fluids. And because you've got a load of electrolytes in your system now, those fluids are going to go into your cells. That's mm -hmm. the idea right clean diet so average person needs about six to eight grams of sodium a day person who is sweating you can probably add a couple more grams to that somebody who profusely sweats maybe four or five grams to that somebody who's like an endurance athlete you could be adding seven or eight grams to that if they're a professional footballer i would suggest doing a sweat test to find out how much sodium you lose per day on average you know so if we can calculate that we know exactly how much they need to put back in again and this is the joy of kind of keeping a diet consistent. So if a diet's consistent, we also know the minerals are consistent. We also know the nutrients are consistent, blah, blah, blah. So you look at, again, Harlan, they'll be able to use him as the example. He will know exactly what he eats every single day. He'll know the macronutrient and micronutrient breakdown of that. I guarantee you. And if he doesn't, his nutritionist does. Yeah. Right. So they all control that. So then we finish training. We want to recover from training. We may have had some breakfast in that interim. So when we woke up, we might have had some breakfast. Or you might be somebody who doesn't function terribly well with breakfast. But in the morning, our body's fasted. So then if we breathe through our mouths when we sleep, hence why nasal breathing is becoming a big thing. So again, I think, again, Harland, Harland tapes his mouth. Yeah. So he breathes through his nose at night. What that does, it means he dehydrates less. Yeah, whilst he sleeps. And also he's breathing and breathing is a large part of sleep and efficiency of sleep. If you get people who don't breathe very well through their nose, quite often they suffer from sleep apnea. Yeah. So if you get people with blocked noses or they've had their nose broken a lot, boxers, martial artists quite often suffer from sleep apnea because of that. Bodybuilders do because, again, just sheer mass. Mm. So they struggle to breathe. So what the breathing does, it stops them breathing temporarily. They wake up, not like opening their eyes, but they wake up and then it takes them in and out of a sleep cycle. So if you were to monitor them on a sleep thing, basically they're coming in and out of sleep hundreds and hundreds of times, which means they wake up the next morning absolutely shattered. Yeah. But they think that they've been asleep for eight hours, right? So again, going back to the, the structure, six hours, caffeine's done, right? So let's say you've got a game at eight o'clock at night. What do you do? You maintain hydration, right? You get in all your nutrients. So you're going into the game, you've got you, you, your cells are packed full of glycogen. Remember, football requires glycogen. It's not a sport where you can use fats and proteins as fuel. It doesn't work that way. It's a glycogen-based sport. So we need carbs, right? So if somebody got a low-carb diet for football is crazy. If you're an amateur footballer and you want to stay lean, cool. You know, but if you're a performance athlete and that is how you pay your bills, you need to think carbs, right? So you've got to have enough carbs in your system to be able to do that. You also need protein for recovery and fats and blah, blah, blah. But you're also going to need a hefty amount of calories. So let's assume you've got all those in. Comes around for the 8 o'clock kickoff. The only element, so we have what's called sleep urge. Sleep urge peaks in the afternoon and peaks just as we go to sleep. And this is the argument for biphasic sleep. So if this is a professional player and they're playing at eight, I'm looking for that first peak of sleep purge, which is about eight hours after you wake, right? Normally about eight hours after you wake, nobody's training at that point, right? Yeah. This is this is about one or two o'clock in the afternoon. At that point, your alertness level starts to drop as well because your body's shifting from a sympathetic to a parasympathetic state. If you've had the caffeine and you had the, uh, the light exposure, that's bang on that time. Alertness is dropping. Sleep urge is peaking, sleep pressure is getting high because, again, caffeine is wearing off. And you've also got cortisol is kind of halfway down because cortisol drives your sympathetic system. When cortisol starts to get low, our fight or flight starts to turn off and we go into the rest of the digest, right? So what's going to happen when you walk out in that football stadium or to the players or whatever, cortisol is going to go flying up again anyways. 
adrenaline's going to go up, sympathetic nervous system going to kick in. All those things are happening anyways. You don't need caffeine because your body will naturally jack up all those systems anyways. Uh, but the cool thing about that, if you let your body jack them all up naturally, they'll all come down fairly rapidly. Jack it up synthetically with caffeine, all those same things will happen, and maybe to a higher degree, but they'll stay up until the caffeine gets metabolized, which is going to be 8, 12 hours after you've taken it. So the problem we have is that caffeine is going to reside in your system until 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning which is no good because at that point you're three hours into sleep and your sleep quality is terrible. Yeah. So we've got the eight o'clock kickoff. So at that point, the only one of those factors that we can compromise or start to just manipulate a little bit is alertness. So this is where we, we and, and again, we created a product around this. We created Flow, which is a caffeine-free nootropic. And let me go through ingredients as what we've got in there. So we've got a full complex of B vitamins. B vitamins help us metabolize uh, macronutrients into energy. In essence, they do a lot of other stuff as well, but all cool stuff. Electrolytes. So I've got electrolytes in there, but we have a, 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 a mild isotonic formula in there, just maintains hydration. It's not there to hyperhydrate or anything like that. Maintains hydration. So you're going to hydrate. You're going to you're going to consume your B bits, and we've also got a load of nootropics, which is all about switching your alertness on and your cognition and your brain function on, so we can focus. It's almost like having eyes on stocks. So I'm going to get you to focus, but I'm not going to compromise your sleep, right? Now, under normal circumstances, what we would do is flow is designed to take six to eight hours after you wake when you get that slump. Now, if you're a professional footballer at that point, I'm going to go, no, you don't take flow at that point. You keep hold of that. But what sleep. you do at that point when you get this slump, because if I want to, if I want to enhance and, and get into that slump, is to sleep. So at this point, I'm going to suggest to a professional footballer, it probably take a, a 90 minutes or, uh, you know, you're either an hour and a half or you're three hours. So we're going to either take a 90 minute nap or a three hour sleep at this point. Right. So if say one o'clock, they turn off all their lights, they simulate complete darkness, they taper all that light down and they put a sleep mask on, put a nasal strip on, paint their mouth, whatever they need to do to ensure that that sleep is going to be good quality. And then they're going to have a 90 minute or a three hour sleep cycle. So that's either one or two sleep cycles. If they get two sleep cycles in, they wake up and guess what happens? Your sympathetic nervous system kicks back in again. So we've basically just created two separate days. Yeah. So the sympathetic nervous system kicks in again. So we don't need caffeine at this point because it's doing it anyways. And what's going to happen is your sympathetic nervous system is going to jack back up again, which means when we get to the eight o'clock kickoff, it's almost like you, you're only halfway through your day. But you're not. What you've done is you've simulated these two windows. And we've already bagged three hours sleep, right? So I only need seven. So I've bagged three hours sleep. So now just before I'm going to kick off, I'm going to hydrate again. Might have some more food, you know, an hour or so before, 90 minutes before. Again, depends on people's digestion and all these various different factors. I remember one of the Premier League footballers back in the day used to eat bacon sandwiches. That was the first thing they woke up and did. Uh, it was one of my United players. I can't remember. I thought, uh, can't remember. Can't remember. Will might come to me, but he used to eat bacon sandwiches. I think it might have been Roy Keane even. And uh, oh, used to eat bacon <laughs> sandwiches. But well, guess what bacon sandwiches made him to made him do? Drink loads and loads of water. Right. Yeah. What's what's a bacon sandwich full of? Sodium. Yeah. So you'd have a bacon sandwich and then you drink loads and loads of fluids. Hyperhydration, right? It was like a Neolithic way of doing hyperhydration. So, so anyway, so, so they have the nap, they're back three hours sleep. They only need four more. All right. So they go into the game. I'd suggest take a load of nootropics, take some electrolytes, which again are all present in flow. So I would say to that player, and we deal with a few athletes at the moment. Uh, we also do, uh, the, I can't, no, it's a podcast. I can't mention one of the people that we're working with on, because uh, yeah, I can't, because I can <laughs> like to talk about it. Uh, but we deal with some racing drivers. Yeah. And it's what level of racing driver I can't allude to, but it's a high level of racing, right? And it's the same challenge that they have because it all depends when the race commences. Mm. And sometimes the races are at night. So we have to rebalance this system. So so then the footballer would have a nap or a sleep, three hours sleep, bag three hours of sleep. So they had high quality as well because they did all the stuff they needed to do, they darkened their environment, blah, blah, blah. So just before the game, they take their serving of floor. 
which has got the electrolytes in, it's got the B vitamins in, it's got all that stuff in. They're packed full of macronutrients because they've eaten. And then they they perform because all Floyd's going to do is increase alertness. That's all they need. Adrenaline, you know, stimulation of your sympathetic nervous system. The crowd's looking after that. In fact, it's a game is looking after that. And what happens if you caffeinate a lot of people is that they go over the top. So they start to create anxiety. So they go out onto the field to play and they, and you tell you one of the sports that they saw this a lot in is uh, MMA. Yeah. So what they do with MMA fighters, yeah. So they prep them for these fights and they'd never use caffeine. And then when it came to fight day, they'd caffeinate them. And all that happened is it created anxiety, which Mm -hmm. is what caffeine does. Because remember, anxiety is just your sympathetic nervous system jacking up. So what caffeine does, it simulates that for some people is, oh, caffeine makes me anxious. So people just generally don't take it. But again, you're simulating anxiety with these footballers. So adrenaline and all these stuff that's already spiking, you now got to spike it even more. I'm like, don't do that. That's crazy. You've just made somebody nervous, even more nervous. You don't want to do that. So again, floor you take floor just before your game, right? Then after your game, you've got to consider all the things that are in place. So firstly, you've got to kind of start winding yourself down. So you've got to get away from all that craziness, right? So you drive away from the ground. You know, ideally, you get someone to drive you if you're a professional athlete because you don't want to be focusing on something and staring at lights and blah, blah, blah. And then we've got to start to manage light. So at that point, the assumption is it's dark anyways. So you've got to start bringing down the level of light you're exposing your optic nerve to because that's causing serotonin to stay high, right? Uh, in a football ground, there's enough light in a football ground. I would anticipate that is high enough with respect to looks, which is light measurement, to keep you awake. Yeah. Right. And if not, it doesn't matter anyways because they're playing a sport. They're not going to have problems with that. Yeah. And afterwards, we then start to think about tapering light down and also switching off your nervous system. So going away and, and things like looking at your phone. So, you know, they say don't look at your phone for 60 to 90 minutes before you go to bed. This is kind of the same thing. So the phone is all about it's not really the blue screen that's the problem. The problem is the content. So if I open an email, what happens? I get an emotional response. My cortisol goes up. You know, so the idea is stay away from anything that's going to spike anything. So when you These leave the ground, reactions on social media and stuff like correct, that as well. Correct. So what a you know, you don't want a footballer leaving the ground, professional football leaving the ground and checking that, you know, what's the report on the game? No, yeah. ignore that. And ignore it for the first 60 to 90 minutes of your day as well. So don't wake up the next morning. First thing do open your phone and see what people have got to say. Because if it's negative, it means your cortisol is going to go up excessively. You know, and, and they talk about this in professional sport. And I think Alex Ferguson was one of the first people that kind of said to their players, you're not allowed to look at social media. Yeah. And actually, you know, it was a it was a, an offense to look at social media or look at your phones at certain times. And 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 I think he just did it out of it, you know, intuitively. He was like, they're gonna read really negative stuff about themselves. So stop doing it. I know in the Beckham documentary you talked about it. Yeah. 100%. You know. It was like removing from that scenario. If it makes you feel unhappy, I would say it's like it's like curating your social media feed. Is that if every time you look at what somebody particularly says and it makes you feel bad about yourself, remove them. If every time you look at them you feel bad about yourself, take them away. So it's the same kind of management tools. So after the game, what I want to do is kind of wind that player down as much as possible. So I'm going to think recovery. So they're going to consume something. If there's somebody who's hypersensitive to eating big meals and not being able to sleep, I'm not going to use a big meal. I'm going to use a supplement, something liquid. But most people are okay. So so remember, I've only got a bag four hours sleep. So really, this player could stay up theoretically till about three in the morning and still bag their sleep. Yeah. Not three in the morning. Sorry, we said six o'clock. So yeah, yeah. he's got till one or two o'clock in the morning to fall asleep. So they could go back, they could wind themselves down, maybe play a computer game, maybe read a, a book, whatever. They've got a good few hours to wind down and fall asleep. But we'd follow the same rules as everybody else. So the screen goes off 90 minutes before they intend to sleep in. You know, they hydrate, they they replenish their fuel, they do whatever it might be. And, you know, the, the sleep supplement that we designed was all about, we looked at the components of sleep. So the components of sleep are what we call sleep latency, which is how long it takes you to fall asleep. Which, which alcohol will improve, but then damage the rest of it. Yeah. You've got sleep consistency, with, which is how how consistently do you remain in low levels of sleep? Sleep consistent means, you know, you might wake up multiple times a night. So if you get up and have a pee, that's compromise your sleep consistency, right? Mm. So we don't want to do that, ideally. Sleep consistency, then we've got sleep duration, which is the one that always everybody talks about, seven to nine hours. You know, So we want to bag that seven at least. And then we've got sleep architecture. 
But remember, if this player has had three hours sleep in the afternoon, I can bag nine. Do I want to bag nine as a professional athlete? Absolutely, I do. Because yeah. if I do, I wake up the next morning, I am firing on all cylinders. I'm waking up, there's zero sleep pressure. I'm fully recovered. All my muscles have done what they needed to do during the night. Or, you know, I'm hydrated. My brain's consolidated all this information. Amazing. I mean, it's perfect players. And remember, that wasn't that complicated, but the, the, the bizarre cultural thing that we did there was sleep in the afternoon. Yeah. But, but you can see how beneficial that is. And remember, if, if, if I've got opportunities to do that as a player, and remember that player at that point when they have that three-hour nap, they've got to turn off their phones, they've got to turn off everything. And they've got to communicate with the people around them and go, during this time, every single day, I am not available. Yeah. Otherwise, they're going to struggle to sleep because they're going to be full of anxiety or people are going to be emailing me, texting me, doing this, that, the other. You know, such and such is going to panic because I'm, I'm out of action. You just tell people. You just go, look, the next three hours, every day of my career, active career, during the hours of one and four every day, I'm out. Just it's, I'm in a meeting. If you're in a meeting, nobody bats an island. I'm in a meeting, you know, and I'm unavailable between one and four. Oh, that's cool, as long as I know that. Nobody starts to freak out and go, I haven't heard from such and such in 10 minutes. Hmm. Which, unfortunately, with the dawn of social media and WhatsApp and blah, 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 everybody's like, oh, my God, I haven't heard from such and such in an hour. They haven't been online. You know, people start flapping, right? You know, so that would be that kind of ideal scenario there. That was incredible. I think there's so much to take from that because I realise there's a hell of a lot of demands on players, some of which we've touched on already with the time to kick off and the, the social media and all that sort of stuff. But we're adding on to that our media duties after games, the actual results of the games, obviously fan remember, pressure. I remember the media duties, right? Which is part of the job. Yeah. So, so we've got to accept that that's part of the job. And remember, a lot of this is actually realising, look, in reality, you know, because in reality, really, this is when we built our range, we were like, we've got to consider reality here. People can't all sleep in the afternoon. Yeah. You know, they can't. You know, reality doesn't work that way. People need to work because consistently, rather than designing floor, we'd have just said, look, at that point, leave work. We don't need to jack anything up. You just mm -hmm. go and relax. Reality doesn't do that. We can't change the entire culture of people. People will continue to work after two o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. Right? Because we need to. And, you know, I need to. I don't stop work at two o'clock in the afternoon. I don't have a nap in the afternoon, but I, I ensure I get to bed at the right time if I can, which is sometimes compromised because we've got a little one, just like you, right? You know, it doesn't always work that way. But when it doesn't work that way, I try to do my best to make sure that I don't get into sleep debt. Yeah. And if you're a professional sports person, I'm like, look, if I tell you to sleep for three hours, you you got no excuse. Mm -hmm. You know? Because I guarantee you'll be on your PlayStation for three and a half hours. Because that's a cultural thing that footballers do. They play games against each other often. You know? So and again, Harland, I don't know what Harland does. He's you know, he's a big Minecrafter, isn't he? Yeah. No, you it's know? it's really interesting. I think the caffeine thing's really interesting as well because from what I've seen, players absolutely smash it all day, all different times of the day. So that education is is crucial, I think, for players. So you touched on real, two really key things there that I think people can start to think about implementing. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, they're, they're simple things. Yeah. But, but again, it's got to almost, you know, I've got to convince someone, you've almost got to get buy-in. And remember, you know, I used to have, I used to have, very high level sports people would come to me and I have very high level CEOs, business people. And they used to come to, like I said, they used to come to me, right? So at that point, I've already got buy-in. I tell them to stand on the head, they'll stand on the head, mm -hmm. you know? So at that point, the thing is, is that that now I've got to convince people that the science and the everything that, that you know, my background or whatever it might be. So what I'm telling you on caffeine, I have no narrative is to tell you this just for fun, you know? Yes, we've got products that, that fit these molds and are designed for this, but that's how they became. You know, they came about because I, I noted this massive problem that we have. You know, people people need to continue to work in the afternoon. So how can we do that without compromising sleep? The only factor that we can influence is alertness. So what have we got? We've got nootropics, but also what other things will help with people's alertness and be, ability to keep functioning? Oh, we need B vitamins. Oh, we need electrolytes. We need to remain hydrated. So can I tick all those boxes? Yeah, I can. Yeah, you know, so that's what we did. We ticked all those boxes that people struggle with. People struggle with hydration. 
you know, and hydration isn't just about drinking water, because remember, if you just consume a bottle of water, you're diluting your electrolytes. And to some degree, you may even be dehydrating yourself. Yeah. You know, because, but again, it depends on your diet. Mm. Most people in their diet, they get enough sodium, potassium, magnesium in the diet. That's cool. So just drink water, you're fine. But remember, when you sweat, you lose a lot of those. So maybe you need some more than the average person. You know, but also you eat a really clean diet, which again, if you talk clean diet, or you have a keto diet or a low carb diet, typically your sodium levels will be really low because of the nature of the diets. Yeah. So those kind of people are the sort of people that probably should be taking electrolytes. Low carb dieters, electrolytes are like the savior. Yeah, yeah. People get brain fog and they get tired, and blah, blah, blah. It's nearly always dehydration. But you mentioned because... before that that's not an appropriate nutrition um, protocol really for a lot of players because of the fact of mm-hmm. it being that quitter. Yeah. No, it's you know at the end of the day it's you know uh, overeating will make a player overweight. Yeah, and when we say overweight, what I mean is that they, there's a, an optimal level of weight for a player. Yeah, right. And it's not we're not getting to the things of you know eating disorders and ballet and blah blah blah. The optimal weight is when their efficiency is at the highest. So if if you look at uh, Force production, force is mass time acceleration. Now, if I just if I put a weighted backpack on you, I re- reduce the level of, I increase the level of mass, which means I will decelerate you. So yeah. if you run as fast as you can, I then put a weight on your back and tell you to run just as fast. You can't, but there's a force equation that comes from that. So the amount of force that you're generating might be the same. You know, so there's always an optimal weight that, that a, a, a player based off their frame and blah, 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 that they'll perform at their best will be, you know? So so you want to kind of maintain that, know that the, the risk of injury goes down and all these different things. So professional players, you know, they don't. Nobody carries really excess weight. I mean, back in the day when the culture was different and people used to eat, you know, eat pies and, uh, you know, drink 10 pints of lager every night. And, you know, but that was the culture. You go back in the 70s, there was a lot of football players that were overweight. Yeah. You know, but no. Now, professional sports, you don't get it because because the sport is a little bit more professional. People know that there's certain habits and behaviors that don't conform with performance, but it doesn't say it still doesn't exist. You know, like I said, you know, this we had this young lad that lived opposite. Was, I, I believe a very very good player, mm. uh, but again, he used to live off fast food, you know, processed foods, blah blah blah, and he'd get away with that to some degree, but, but you know, because he burns a lot of calories. But is that optimal performance? I would argue no. You know, there's you know, you can have them now and again, there's no problem, just top up his calories and you know, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But you know. Brilliant. Phil, that was superb. It's definitely gonna get the listeners thinking. So I really appreciate you coming on. I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, I feel like we've covered loads there. So I really appreciate you going into so much detail on all that and giving us a bit of a blueprint as well for evening kickoffs and getting people thinking about the structure of what that day could look like and any potential changes they could make as well. So do you want to just finish us off? I know you've mentioned a few times in terms of some, we've not gone into like the actual businesses that you're involved with, but just anywhere that people could sort of keep up to date with what you've got going on. Yeah, cool. So I, I have two primary businesses. One, we coach coaches. So we coach them in business, nutrition and coaching. So, so I still remain in that space. I don't coach people one-on-one anymore. I do a lot of consultancy. Uh, I do a lot of, again, podcasts and interviews and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but two businesses. So I've got the Advanced Coaching Academy. So that's our coaching stuff. And then my, my supplement brand is Human24, HMN24. Uh, and again, we design the supplements around circadian biology, chronobiology. But in essence, when we talk to it, the lay person, it's a sleep-work cycle. So we're looking at uh, any high performers, in essence. The whole the whole product range is designed around high performers. Uh, very relevant to people who travel lots, very relevant to people who are in the corporate space, very relevant to people who have, have lived in cultures where they caffeinate too much and when they, you know, and, and there is just this high demand and this high pressure job. So we have a lot of uh, high-end corporate users, uh, airline pilots. We've got a remarkable uh, micro community of airline pilots that use us. Uh, we work with the military uh, at varying degrees. Uh, and, and, and yeah, so, so that's what we do, but they'll find us at, uh, hmn24.com. Uh, uh, our, our Instagram handle is probably the most commonly used, which is hmn24 underscore. 
Uh, and you'll find me at the PT coach. So that's my Instagram at the PT coach and uh, advancedcoachingacademy.com. So any of those windows. But but yeah, it's, uh, you know, I love getting on podcasts and talking about these things. So thank you for having me. Uh, it's always nice to talk about these things and, and also put them into a different context. You yeah. know, it's nice to be talking specifically about a sport and and sort of the ins and outs of that sport and certainly to to put in a structure there to to look at what is one of the biggest challenges. And again, we go back on the Delhi Alley thing. It was you, know, you understand fully why people are taking sleeping tablets. Mm-hmm. You know, but again, we can just with that structure that we talked about there, we can we can eradicate the need for that largely. And we can make a big, big impact into there. And remember, you know, even if that sleep cycle in the afternoon was only 90 minutes, you're still 90 minutes less sleep that you need to get. So and and that might come into play whether, you know, if I'm dealing with somebody who's who, you know, who plays, who lives. You know, you, you'll have players that live two hours from the ground. If you live two hours from the ground, you've got to think, oh, I, I probably need a driver. I probably don't want to fall asleep in the car, uh, you know, because then I've got to wake back up again at the other end, uh, which again is a is a, is a a bad sleep cycle. But they could have a nap in there. And again, yeah. the science behind 30-minute napping, we don't know. They could have a 30-minute nap. But then would that compromise their ability to sleep later? We don't know. It's an interpersonal thing. Uh, but it even if somebody got that 90 minute sleep, uh, you know, depending on how far the ground is from their hotel or from their, you know, their place of sleep uh, would be the factor. But, but, but even in some cases you might be able to, you know, it might be a matter of, uh, you know, players getting booked in at a hotel that's literally around the corner. Uh, I mean, I know some grounds actually have hotels attached to them, yeah. uh, uh, you know, linked to them in some ways. So, so there's loads of different ways of looking at it, but it's, you know, where, you know, if there's any any of your listeners that are at clubs and want a bit of consultancy about how how they manage their players, we're more than happy to do that. You know, Human Twenty Four. That's 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 kind of what we do. We go into corporate. Uh, we do some big work with TikTok at the moment. We're doing uh, you know on a, a corporate level. Uh, we've worked with quite a few of the big city firms and blah blah blah. So so yeah, you're always open to it. Amazing, Phil. I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much for coming on. I'm off for a sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, mate. Take care. All right. Thanks.